Joan Bavaria was one of the greatest pioneers of socially responsible investing. A true visionary, she came up with the idea that capital markets can't function if they're not factoring in the real value of sustainability, how we treat our planet, and the people who have inherited it. Joan had a practical idealism where she understood the power of radical collaboration. Joan figured out how to structure dialogues with companies over many years that led to some of the largest Fortune 500 companies in the United States joining the series company network and committing to disclosing in a standardized format their sustainability impacts. Joan began her career at the Bank of Boston. It was there that she recognized the appetite from investors who wanted to integrate social and environmental values into their decisions. At the founding of Ceres in 1989, Joan Bavaria said, today a broad coalition is calling upon corporations to clean up their business, to stop corporate pollution and invest in the earth. Today, we're saying no more Exxon Valdez. The public is fed up. Under her leadership, Ceres launched the Ceres Principles, the Global Reporting Initiative, and the Ceres Investor Network on Climate Risk. She looked for the evidence of possibility rather than accepting the received wisdom of impossibility. She had a remarkable appreciation for systems and for finding the levers of change for those systems. Her legacy in founding both Ceres and Trillium is the insight that the greatest potential for change comes from connecting investors, nonprofits, and corporations to work together on common goals. In 2008, Joan lost her battle to cancer. That same year, Ceres and Trillium Asset Management created the Joan Bavaria Award to honor her leadership. Trillium Asset Management and Ceres developed the Bavaria Award as a tangible way of continuing Joan's impact. Through the award, we recognize people whose work has a catalytic effect, people whose work improves social, environmental, and economic outcomes in substantial and meaningful ways. The world is now accepting corporate leaders, financial leaders, like so many people that work with Ceres. We now understand and know that we must integrate sustainability into capital markets. But really, Joan was the inspiration, and I could not be more humbled to help carry out her vision many years later. Joan Bavaria set the standard for the level of innovation today's leaders must possess to confront today's challenges. Ceres and Trillium Asset Management are proud to present this award to continue carrying Joan's legacy into a brighter future she helped to shape. Good afternoon. This is Matt Patsky. I'm the CEO of Trillium Asset Management. It is one of the greatest honors for me annually to be able to present the Joan Bavaria Award. Joan Bavaria founded Trillium in 1982. She founded the Social Investment Forum in 1984 and founded, of course, Ceres in 1989. Joan dedicated her entire career to changing the capital markets to promote sustainable and responsible investing. We gather annually to honor another player in this space who has dedicated their careers to changing the capital markets for the better to promote sustainable and responsible investing. It gives me great pleasure to announce that the winner of this year's Joan Bavaria Award is Mark Campanali. Mark was the founder of the Jupiter Ecology Fund in 1989 one of the first environmentally responsible investment funds in Europe. He also was the founder of UK CIF in 1990. Um, in addition to all the work he did on Carbon Tracker, Mark was one of the first to discuss the concept of stranded assets and the fact that we are uh, currently unable to burn safely all of the fossil fuels that are currently uh, in the ground and identified as identified reserves in the ground. Uh, Mark, like Joan, has committed his life to building the field of sustainable and responsible investing and is incredibly deserving of this award. I will also add that Joan obviously knew Mark well and I know is right now smiling as I present the award to Mark Campanali. Thank you. Well, thank you, Matt, for that very kind introduction. My name is Mark Campanali. I'm the founder and executive chair of the Carbon Tracker Initiative. And I'm delighted to be this year's recipient of the Joan Bavaria Award, which is something very special and precious to me, but also I know to 
many of my uh, colleagues in the sustainable and responsible investment industry. And I'm joined as a recipient of this award by some fantastic names who've come ahead of, of me, uh, some Brits like Helen Wildsmith, but not least of which are uh, my good and dear um, friend in Memorial, Tessa Tennant. And in fact, it was Tessa who first introduced me to Joan some 30 years ago now, when Joan came to London to launch what was called the Valdez Principles, which if my history tells me correct, evolved into series. And what I learned from that time um, in meeting Joan is the importance of pursuing an ideal. And her ideal was the role that institutional investors and the broader financial community can play in holding large corporations to account. And then it was an oil company, Exxon, with their spill with Valdez. And the principles were really around a set of, um, well, it's a word, principles which would drive corporate accountability. And rolling on 30 years, that same message is true today, which is the accountability of large corporations in holding them to account for their role in runaway uh, climate change. And the world is totally different now. It's not just an oil spill that we have to be concerned about. It's the rise in global temperatures, extreme weather events, whether it's floods um, or heat waves, or in the US, the fires that we've seen, which have also spread around the world to places like North America um, and Australia, of course. And climate change is the driving issue, really, that I've been concerned about as the winner of this year's award. Um, just to roll back a little bit of history. So what did Carbon Tracker do? What was my award about? It was um, something that 20 years ago, my other co-founder of Carbon Tracker, Nick Robbins, who was with me at Henderson at the time, we were thinking about the coal, oil and gas IPOs, the listings of these oil and gas and coal companies on the London Stock Exchange. It was also happening globally. And, and we asked the question, well, what if these companies were to develop all their reserves? How much would that lead to rises in atmospheric CO2? And what happened to these companies like Shell and BP and Exxon if they can't burn all their reserves? And we thought about it a lot. And I read a few prospectuses, one of which was the prospectus of a company called Extrata, which is now part of Glencore, who said that essentially uh, climate change really was an issue, but not that much of an issue in our opinion, just 20 lines in a 300 page prospectus. And so we thought to ourselves, well, look, there's probably a flaw at the heart of all these companies. Let's go and do the calculation. And the calculation that we did, which probably is the one that made Carbon Tracker uh, and the carbon bubble and the stranded assets idea was to add up the cumulative CO2 in the reserves and resources of these global corporations. And then how much atmospheric to CO2 would increase and what warming would increase if they did develop all the reserves. And we found that there was four times, five times more reserves ready financed and owned by these large corporations that could possibly be burned if we were to stay way below two degrees. We call that the carbon bubble. And the report for which I'm the delighted uh, recipient of, the work of James Leeton and Nick Robbins and myself at the launch, um, and our chairman, Jeremy Leggett. And of course, the, the support of, of, of others that were around us at the time, including Tessa Tannen, my good friend, um, was to say, well, actually, this changes everything. And the report, Unburnable Carbon, Other Worlds Carrying a Carbon Bubble, and then the following one, Stranded Assets and Wasted Capital, uh, coined those phrases. And, and we said this represents a, an existential crisis or a threat to financial stability if all the bank loans and the equity is missed, the risk is not properly assessed. And if the credit rating agencies have got it wrong and the, and the um, market regulators are missing this, it really represents something very substantial. Well, so we produced 100 copies of this report. We didn't think that it was going to be read by many people. Um, and one copy actually got into the hands of, of Naomi Klein, as we understand it, and she gave it to Bill McKibben. And Bill McKibben wrote an article in Rolling Stone magazine called Global Warming's Terrifying New Math. And it was that article that was catalytic in helping to develop the fossil fuel divestment movement. And so even though our report didn't mention the words divestment anywhere in it, it's been used by two groups of people to frame the argument as to why responsible investors should address the climate change risk. First, the divestment movement was mobilizing students and activists to divest from fossil fuels, the trustees of pension schemes, large endowments and foundations. And then they in turn, uh, forced fund managers and pension fund trustees to think about climate risk. But on the other hand, 
Uh, we had um, others that we knew very well, and I did from my previous role working at Henderson Global Investors and, and that career with institutional fund management that I had is that we could use the power of engagement. And I was uh, delighted to join others, um, including Ceres and IGCC at a meeting in New York some three, four years ago now that led to the launch of Climate Action 100 um, under the leadership of well, Mindy, but also um, uh, Anne Simpson at uh, CalPERS uh, and many others that actually said, let's put a coalition that would hold these corporates to account as well. So an echo really of those early days of the Valdez principle. So C100 now it's reached the $52 trillion coalition um, is holding not just the fossil fuel companies to account, but all the major global emitters. And I'm delighted that today Carbon Tracker, along with the Transitions Pathway Initiative and 2DI and Influence Map are providing data into Climate Action 100. So we've had like a pincer movement. On one hand, the divestment movement really drawing a line in the sand. On the other hand, corporate engagement movement. Um, and this really kind of tells a story of Carbon Tracker and the carbon bubble. I think the highlight for me in all of this um, was being asked by Mark Carney, the governor then of the Bank of England, in his role there to come and address the Financial Stability Board and the G20 of the central bankers. It would have been about six years ago now at the Bank of England, where I presented the carbon bubble stranded assets thesis. And a few weeks later, Mark Carney gave his speech to Lloyds of London, uh, echoing the, the phrases from the first carbon tracker report on stranded assets and unburnable carbon and keeping most fossil fuels in the ground. Um, and so this has really echoed around the world. And for that reason, I'm thrilled to be holding the Joan Bavaria Award in recognition of where we've got to, but it's a story of really the whole sustainable and responsible investment community acting together and working together. And now my passion is supporting a new initiative with investors and NGOs and civil society groups called the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which says to deal with climate as a collective problem, as a collective challenge, and we must wind down the production of fossil fuels. The urgency is even there still today. And I'm leading part of it called the Global Registry of Fossil Fuel Production, which again carries on the story for another 10 years, I think, as we put our arms around the challenge of dealing with the climate crisis, the central role of investors here, and how we must really bring an end to the fossil fuel age with the rise of the clean technology and, and the cleaner, greener future. So thanks everyone um, for listening through to my story and, uh, and I look forward to hearing the rest of today's conference. Another well-deserved congratulations to our friend and colleague, Mark Campanelli, and a special thank you to our friends at Trillium for your continued support of Ceres over the years. And before we move to our next plenary, I'd like to remind you all of our evening program tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern time featuring Executive Chairman of Ford Motor Company, Bill Ford, and then at 7 p.m. Eastern time, we have a special event with actress and songwriter Mary Steenburgen celebrating Earth You Big Old Thing You, an animated film dedicated to a beautiful love song to the planet. And now I wanna ask my friend Ted Danson to come back on the screen to give us a quick preview into the event tonight. Ted? Oh, I can't wait for you all to see and hear this. It is uh, just remarkable. Um, you know, I, I hope you get a chance, maybe uh, Mary can join us to kind of tease what's happening uh, uh, with the conference. Music, you know, just cuts through everything. It cuts through languages, it cuts through, um, you know, it's straight to the heart. And then when you add animation to that, it is just uh, very effective. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for everyone to see Earth, you big old thing, you. Well, that's great. We would love to have Mary join us for a few minutes. Well, as it turns out, my wife, Mary Steenburgen, is right here. Wow. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to be in the same house as Ted. Isn't it amazing? You guys work together, you live together, you love together. That's great. <laughs> First of all, thank you for talking to me about it. And Dawn, we, um, I'm, I'm sure Ted's already expressed our um, admiration and love for you. And just as someone who's um, known you for, for many years now, the project that we're talking to all of you about 
is um, really began as a song. And from that moment, this little snowball just started rolling and it became important to us that night to write a love song to the planet, to just, to just pour love into what an extraordinary privilege it is to live on this planet. And it, because I think we're all the three of us a little bit quirky in our own ways. It came out very kind of whimsical and quirky, but it's a love song, a full on love song to the planet. And then people started hearing it and especially fellow musicians. And they were the ones that said, oh no, this is a song and you've got to do something with this. It's really special. And people kept calling us and asking us about it. And I, I uh, was also working on a project, uh, writing the music for an animated film that my friend Penny Finkelman Cox, who uh, produced the Shrek series, she's one of the really most important people in animation today. Um, she and I were working on a different project together, but I said, let me play this song for you. And she listened to it and she goes, Mary, it's an animated film. It's an animated film that's a love song to the planet. And so that's where the whole thing began. And in our mind would be something that uh, could raise awareness um, of what we, how we need to honor this planet that we live on, but also unite families all over the world in being able to sing it and stand in front of their home or their place that they love so that it might be a sort of we are the world type of movement. But that's what we're going to be talking to all of you about. And, um, and it's been really a fun thing to be a part of already. It's been fun for us to know a little bit more. We, we knew what you were doing kind of from afar. You probably knew more than I did. But, but to realize the enormity of kind yeah. of what you're doing and what it's grown into and the enormous potential and the fact that it's a moment in time where people are asking for guidance about where to put their money and their energy. And, and they're, they're realizing they have no choice but to do this. I mean, all that devastation in Texas, yeah. you know, uh, there's just no way that these arguments against the fact that there's no such thing as global warming or, no, or climate change, you know, uh, it's just not, it's not going to fly anymore. And the fact that the fact that you guys are, are pointing in directions for people and, and helping them to do the right thing is so exciting. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we know having gone through this period over the last year, our world needs hope and you are our heroes actually for bringing this to us and allowing us to have this opportunity to partner with you and share that hope and inspiration. So thanks so much. Thank you. Loved you guys both. Love, Love you too. You.